Hello, I'm Trevor, and I want to welcome you to the JPEG experience. Today, I'm putting my Canon EOS R5 through its toughest test yet, and my personal favorite, astrophotography. I've had my Canon EOS R5 for about three weeks now, and I have been continually impressed with just about everything I've thrown at it. Animal photography, macro photography, landscapes, product photography, time lapses. But to be honest, I've been nervous about the EOS R5 and night sky photography. I took a leap of faith ordering the R5, and my hope for the R5 is that it proves to be an all around workhorse of a camera. I love a lot of different areas of photography and I want a great general purpose camera that will allow me to just go out and do what I love. I've waited a long time for Canon to release an all purpose workhorse and so far the R5 has done everything I've expected and more. I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of what this camera can do. My biggest concern with buying the R5 was that I had no idea how well it would perform in very low light. And there's been very little information on just how well it would perform taking nightscapes. The camera has been out for a little while now and there's still very little information on this topic. So I will be testing out the R5 and how it performs taking Milky Way images and share what I discover with you. I need to be confident with the camera before I take it out on longer and more difficult Milky Way photo shoots. It's a really bad idea taking unproven gear on important or difficult trips. I want to know what limitations the R5 has so I can be prepared for what those are in the future. For example, I plan to find out how the ISO performs taking pictures of the night sky and what its ceiling is for acceptably clean images. To do this, I will be comparing the R5 to the Canon R. I have been using the Canon R for about two years now, and I have been very happy with its image quality in very low light. Using the R, my personal ISO ceiling is about 8000, but I prefer to keep it to about 6400 for nice clean Milky Way images. My hope for the R5 will be for it to match the EOS R in this regard. If the R5 can produce nice clean images at 6400, I will be happy. My experience so far with the R5 suggests that it does surprisingly well with noise at high ISO, and my gut says that it should match or exceed the R in image quality, but I won't know for sure until I try. To test this, I will take the same image with both cameras with the same lenses at the same settings and compare them after the fact. I will also be taking dark frames on both cameras and comparing those. The Canon R sensor performs exceptionally well in this regard. If the R5 matches the R, I will be very impressed. This is probably the area I am most nervous for the R5. You might be asking yourself, what is a dark frame and why is this important? A dark frame is simply a picture taken with the lens cap on to not allow any light to hit the sensor. This is important because when no light or information hits the sensor of the camera, weird things can be introduced in the image. Some cameras will have purple patches. Uh, for example, many Canon cameras, there is banding, which are these terrible lines introduced. It can be very difficult to fix this in post-processing. So why is this important for night sky photography? Taking pictures of the night sky is almost like taking a dark frame. There's barely any light that is hitting the sensor. If a spot or area of the sensor doesn't get enough light, the camera can in introduce those same problems you can see in the dark frames. It's super annoying to get a great image of the Milky Way or some nightscape 
and there being lines or patches in the final image. Even worse, they can be difficult or nearly impossible to get rid of in post-processing. For example, here is a dark frame from the Canon 5DS, which is not known to be a good low light camera. Here we are in Lightroom. In this example from the 5DS, I took a 15 second exposure at 6400 ISO. You can see that I turned off all sharpening and noise reduction. You can see as I turn up the exposure one stop at a time, the banding will become more obvious. If your camera has severe banding, you can expect to see this in your final image. Here's an example from July of the comet Neowise. You will see the same banding in the final image of the comet, and this is just an extra problem to overcome in post-processing if your camera sensor has this issue. But if there is a problem with the dark frames, there are workarounds. You would just need to work a little harder and find a nice balance of longer shutter times or wider apertures to allow more light and balance that against the movement of the night sky. You could also introduce something like a star tracker to allow longer shutter times without the problem of star trails. It's also important to know that ISO doesn't do anything in this equation. ISO simply multiplies the sensitivity to light, and if there is no light hitting the sensor, multiplying nothing is still nothing. Understanding the balance of the shutter speed, aperture, and the movement of the stars is the important thing. I will be heading out to the Los Padres National Forest around 100 miles outside of Los Angeles. It has Bortle three skies, which is reasonably dark for being so close to Los Angeles. I will have about two hours with the Milky Way with the moon out and another two hours with the Milky Way after the moon sets. My bags are packed, let's go. We just arrived here in uh, Los Padres National Forest. Uh, me and Nick, who's setting up over here to my right. Uh, we are testing out the Canon R5. Uh, tonight I am using two lenses, the Rokinon 14mm 2.8, and I am using the Canon 15 to 35 2.8. So I'm setting up shooting for the R5. You can see uh, I'm gonna put it into manual mode. Uh, 15 seconds, 2.8 ISO 6400. I am in manual mode. Going to the CF Express card. I am gonna set a two second delay. I'm going to put a uh, manual uh, white balance of 4,000. That way all the shots are consistent. Uh, so I just did a comparison between the R and the R5. Uh, I did, I swapped out lenses. So I did the Rokinon 14 millimeter 2.8 and I did the 15 to 35 uh, 2.8 on both lenses. And so we'll just do a quick comparison to test to see which of the two bodies is, is better and uh, to see how much of a difference it truly is. Uh, so now that I did the comp quick comparisons between the two, uh, I'm going to do a panning time lapse. Uh, the first one I'm going to do on the R, uh, just 15 degrees per hour, just tracking the Milky Way. Uh, and the next one I'm going to set up my uh, star tracker and then get, I want to check out the star tracker on the 35 millimeter and uh, 
get a real close up and just kind of track that into the sky and stay tuned, check this out. I mean, I love this 14 millimeter uh, Rokinon 2.8 so easy to find infinity focus uh, it's manual lens so just a piece of cake for night sky photography uh, the 15 to 35 uh, i had to use the on-screen infinity finder and it's like not as exact so i'm less confident that it's got like perfect focus on the stars or this This, uh, this you can see, you just line it up perfectly like that and there's no question, I have infinity focus. So, I'm a little concerned about that on the 15 to 35, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty confident it's, it's got it on point, so uh, we'll, we'll find out soon. So we just finished uh, shooting the Milky Way with the Canon R and the R5. Uh, we just packed up, threw everything in the truck, and uh, we're just about to head home. So that turned out to be a pretty interesting evening. It was a nice easy trip to test out the R5, but while looking for a decent composition, I decided to hike down a little hill and I almost uh, stepped on a rattlesnake. Uh, we scared each other and we both went our separate ways. Uh, at that point, I decided to do the rest of my test uh, on, for the R5 right next to the car for the rest of the evening. Uh, so a few things I noticed while out on the field. Uh, the first was finding infinity focus on the 15 to 35 is a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, so you throw it into manual mode with the little switch here on the side and you use this little focus bar on the screen uh, which is real small and the focus indicator is itty bitty and it's a little uncomfortable to uh, find exactly right in the middle of the symbol. Um, I've grown uh, a little bit lazy with these manual lenses like this uh, 14 millimeter 2.8 from Rokinon where all you have to do is just slide what you want and line it up with this little bar right here. So F2.8 and then infinity focus like that, uh, easy peasy. Um, one thing with the 15 to 35, it was an absolute luxury to be able to easily switch from a 15 millimeter uh, focal length to a 20 millimeter focal length a 24, a 28, and a 35, real easy with one lens, uh, all at 2.8. So that was that was real nice, um, and I look forward to using it at all those different focal lengths uh, for different compositions. Uh, one thing I was concerned with on the R5 was IBIS. Um, I was wondering if the IBIS in body would uh, mess with the stars at all. Uh, I've never had a camera with IBIS in it before. Um, I read somewhere that if you turn off the stabilizer on the lens, it also turns off IBIS in body, uh, which is nice and easy if your lens has that little toggle. But on the, but on the manual lens, there is no toggle switch for image stabilization and so I looked through the menu to see if there was a option to turn off IBIS in the uh, in the menu but uh, there doesn't seem to be one. I know that the camera is on a tripod and there shouldn't be shaking at all but I was it's still a bit of a concern. One real nice thing I noticed on the LCD of the R5 
is that it actually picks up some of the brighter stars, which helps fine tune composition without having to take a bunch of shots and fine tune and take a shot and fine tune to get the correct composure. The battery life of the R5 was actually really good. Uh, I was using a third party LPE6 and I took a two hour time lapse and then another hundred shots after that and my battery charge ended up to be around 32 percent uh, anyway let's go to the pc and check out some of the comparisons between the r5 and the r so here we are in lightroom uh, we're looking at the canon eos r a dark frame first so here i go to the detail tab and make sure that sharpening is turned off Noise reduction is turned off just so that there's a consistency between comparisons. So here's one stop, two stops, three stops, four stops, and five stops. You can see a little bit of bending, but overall looks real good. Let's head on over to the R5. 15 second exposure, 6400 ISO. We are in the turning down the sharpening, noise reduction off. Here's one stop, two stops, three stops, four stops, and five stops. So far, it looks real good on the R5. Uh, just a little bit of banding. Now I'll take this into library mode and I will compare the two dark frames. You have the Canon R to the right. You have the Canon R5 to the left. Both look pretty good. Um, it's hard to tell if it's better than the R, but let's throw this into Photoshop and see if we can do a real good comparison between the two. So far the R5 looks real good as we wait for Photoshop to load up. Uh, first thing I'm going to have to do is that I labeled both the R5 image and the R image on the right hand side. Enlarge the canvas, uh, which uh, really shows the difference between the 45 megapixel with the R5 and the 30 megapixels with the Canon R. So let me put them next to each other on the same enlarged canvas. Let me drag the much larger R5 image to the right and the smaller 30 megapixel image to the left. Let's uh, zoom in to see if we can get a good comparison. Man, it's uh, really hard to say, but the R5 definitely looks like it's better. Wow. Um, this is very surprising, but the R5 has a very clean dark frame. Let me go ahead and export these out and you can see uh, the full image on this video. So here I've exported both the R and the R5 uh, dark frames, uh, put them side by side. Uh, they're both 100% quality. Uh, which one do you think looks better? And here we go. At the beginning of this video, I thought the R5 might not have as good of a dark frame as the R. Both dark frames look really good, but I think that the R5 looks better. I'm definitely impressed. I always use the NPF rule to photograph the night sky. I use the PhotoPills app for a nice, easy calculation. For the following examples, at 14 millimeter with the R, I can have as long as 17 second exposures without any star trailing. With the R5, it's 15 seconds. For the upcoming comparison, I shot both examples with 15 second exposures. Let's move forward and compare Milky Way shots taken from the R and the R5. Here we are in Lightroom. I have taken off all sharpening and noise reduction for the following comparisons. Both shots are exactly the same, taken with the same lens at the same settings a few minutes apart. Let me toss these into Photoshop and do the comparison. First thing I will do is enlarge the canvas on Photoshop. This way, you can see the difference between the R and the R5. 
Again, the R is a 30 megapixel image and the R5 is a 45 megapixel image and the size difference is significant. I will mask out half of the R image and overlay it on the R5 image. I see this test done a lot of the two different sized images next to each other and then zoomed in one to one but I think this is misleading because it's not zoomed in one to one because the larger image is already zoomed in to do the comparison. Doing this comparison test, it is pretty much a toss up between the R and the R5. Let me switch this up and do a comparison that is taking the size difference of the image into consideration. I have two examples. The first example is the R on the right enlarged to match the 45 megapixel of the R5, which is on the left. I think there is a significant difference now and the R5 clearly looks better. So now let's do the opposite. Let me downsize the R5 image to match the 30 megapixel image of the Canon R. Again, the R5 on the left looks much cleaner. Remember, no sharpening or editing has been done on either file outside of the defaults of the camera. To give you a better comparison, I have exported all the files into JPEGs and now let's compare them. These are both full quality JPEGs at their normal sizes, 30 megapixels to the left, 45 megapixels to the right. Again, I see a lot of people compare images like this and I don't think it's exactly fair. I think this may be a reason why people are so impressed with smaller megapixel images. I think a lot of people compare a small file next to a large file like this, like it's a one to one test, but in reality, it's closer to a two to one test. If we are comparing it in this way, it looks like the EOS R file is better, but the R5 still holds its own. Let's move on to a couple true one to one comparisons. Here we have some unedited images upscaled to 45 megapixels side by side. It definitely looks like the R5 is better. Let's do this test again with the same unedited images downscaled to 30 megapixels side by side. The R5 again looks better. Here we have the same test at 30 megapixels, but this time both files have been edited. The edit is exactly the same on both, except for the white balance is slightly different. Again, in this example, the R5 looks superior. Now, let's do an ISO comparison on the R5. This first image is unedited and unsharpened. It's shot at 15 millimeters, 15 seconds, f 2.8 at 6400 ISO. I think the image quality looks great. Next is at 20 millimeters and this time down to a 10 second exposure to accommodate the focal length. The quality looks good to me. Here it's at 24 millimeters and again at 10 second exposures. I did break the NPF rule a little which should have been 9 seconds but the image still looks pretty good and the unedited noise at 6400 ISO is really good. Now, 35 millimeters at six seconds, this time to accommodate the longer focal length and ISO at 8000. This is where my ISO ceiling was with my Canon R and this still looks great at ISO 8000. Now the same settings, but with 12,800 ISO and it looks surprisingly good. Still at 35 millimeters with a six second exposure with 25,600 ISO, which I would never have touched in the past. This is stretching it for me, but it still looks usable, but you can start to see significant noise and now some of the banding patterns we saw in the dark frames. Again, same settings, but vertical. Now, Let's go crazy and try out 51,200 ISO. It's surprisingly good considering it's 51,200 ISO, which would normally be an absolute mess. You can see significant noise and some more obvious banding patterns 
from the dark frames, but vertical. Now let's do that test again with the exact same images, but this time edited in Lightroom with modest sharpening and noise reduction. All images have a noise reduction of 40 in Lightroom. I am very impressed with the image quality for night sky photography with the R5. I can safely say that I can comfortably shoot at ISO 12800 and if necessary as high as 25600 and still get good quality images. This camera has continually impressed me with everything I have thrown at it. If you are curious about any of the gear used in this video, please see the links below in the description. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video and would like to see more, please like and subscribe below. Your support really does help me out a lot. And if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. Thanks again for watching. Goodbye for now and I'll see you next time.